Last time I was uh, about halfway through our discussion of Anselm's Cur Deus Homo, you remember that? And Jordan, were you here for that? Wake up, son. Yeah. Late night last night? Yeah. Can you recall anything of our conversation about Cur Deus Homo? Get us back into the flow of thought, as it were. Well, I just remember that he said that Christ, when he died on the cross, could not be uh, fully man, because that would be ineffective. Or could not be simply fully man, because that was ineffective, because that would be the same thing. But then he said that he could be fully God. Uh, yeah, I want to be careful how you're putting that there, because uh, we affirm he's both truly yeah. man and truly yeah. God. He can't be just, just man or just God. All right. That's true. All right. Remember that? That was kind of the basic uh, idea we were playing with. And then we were talking about the seriousness of any particular crime that we might commit against God. Remember that? We were having a little conversation, remember that, Megan, about... Who was it? Was it? Who was it? Was spitting? Oh, it was Sydney, that guy. Yeah. What was the point of that little discussion? Remember that? Sydney spitting at me? You were saying that if he spat at you, then it would take a while to pay off. That spitting in God's face is an infinite death that we can't pay. All right. Yeah, I'll remember that. That's Anselm's logic. If we had more time, we'd read some of Curtius Holmut's great reading. <coughs> he writes in the Platonic fashion. It's a dialogue, you know, except in this case, it's Anselm as the master talking to. And I've always thought it's funny when you read it. Some of you will have an opportunity to sometime or other. The guy that Anselm is speaking with is a guy by the name of Boso. Not to be confused with Bozo, of course, although sometimes he does seem to come across that way. But you get the point. Anselm's idea is that any crime, any sin that we commit, any act of disobedience against God is of infinite seriousness, even if it seems to be a minor sin, because of the infinite dignity of the one that we are insulting by our act. So, if there's going to be justice, Anselm says, the amount that must be repaid to pay the debt we owe is an infinite debt. It's more than we have. So you're going to have to go to work. And your labor is going to be a labor of being reduced to the same indignity that your sin imposed on God. And that's called hell. And it takes precisely eternity because it is precisely infinite. All right? So, now don't throw anything at me. I'm just speaking sort of loosely here. Sometimes this is my way to see whether students are really awake. So, there's hope for people in hell. <laughs> heresies, heresies. I see it, red lights flashing. As soon as you've been there, Sarah, for exactly forever, you're free to leave. <laughs> right? Grab that. All you got to do is pay off an infinite debt, which will take infinite time. And once you've done that, you are free to go. It's kind of encouraging, isn't it, Spencer? <laughs> yeah. All right. So that's the point. Uh, I'm glad you didn't. Uh, I, I've invited Spencer on more than one occasion to throw me right out the window if I, uh, uh, you know, walk off the pier into heresy land. And I, I saw him kind of, uh, you know, rolling up his sleeves a little bit there, getting ready. All right, so that's half of the story of Curtius Homo. It is impossible for us to pay off the debt that we've incurred to the deity by virtue of our sin, even in the slightest degree, let alone the incredible numbers of sins we pile on, you know. So it's not like there's one sin which is sufficient to condemn you to hell forever. 
but every one of us, since we rolled out of bed this morning, has compounded the felony, and we've added to our quantum of guilt. And so hell, that ghastly Christian doctrine that Anselm fully endorsed, is a, is a necessity of justice. Well, then you say, okay, if, if I'm not able to pay off this debt because I don't have the dignity to do so, you know, then who does? And obviously there's only one being in the universe that has the same dignity as God, and that being would be Stephen. Who's the only being in the universe that has the same dignity as God? The only being with exactly the same dignity as God is. Jesus. Well, yes, okay, we, we get there eventually. But right, it takes, it takes God to have the dignity of God, right? Yes. You know, no one else would have it, right? So Anselm's question is, why does Christ have to be both God and man? And obviously the answer is because only God has the, in, the dignity of God, and thus... In a sense, you can put this one who is God into the same position as our sin. See, inflicted on God. See that? Lower shelf. Everybody, you need more Kleenex? It's in the lower shelf. Just feel free. Although I think I'm running low. I think it's uh, gradually disappearing. Ooh, good heavens. No, don't send those around yet. So please get this. Anselm's theory is this. My sin inflicts injury on God because I rob him of his honor. God inflicts precisely the same indignity on Christ, robbing him of his honor in precisely the same measure as our sin insulted God in the first place. So it's called, Anselm's view is called, the commercial theory. Commercial because Anselm conceives of this whole problem using the metaphor of the marketplace. I rob somebody in the marketplace of a banana. I am therefore required to repay the injury, the banana. But if the banana had ultimate, infinite value, then I'm going to have to work for the rest of eternity to pay it off, right? And so that's what's happening. In the marketplace metaphor, I've robbed God and now need to pay him off, but I don't have the requisite resources. I need someone as rich as God to pay back the debt. And so Christ comes along, and the reason he has to be God is because only God can pay that debt. The reason he has to be man is because it happens to be man that owes the debt. He can't just be God, because God doesn't owe the debt in and of himself. He can't just be man, because man doesn't have the value, the worth to pay it off. It's got to be both. Hence, he's the God man. If that makes sense. That's a classic theory of the atonement. No one had really quite worked it out that closely till Anselm. Even Augustine didn't quite work it out that way. But the church basically decided that was pretty close to the mark. That's what's happening at the cross. Krista. Oh, well, I was just going to ask if that was heretical because it sounded okay to me. Like, is this, yeah, it is. Okay, it sounds okay to you. <laughs> That's right, because yeah. the church reached the conclusion and Selm got the right answer on this one. There had been many theories of the atonement, and there still are. You know, you'll find all kinds of various theories of what happened in the atonement. There's the ransom theory. There's the uh, so-called token theory. There's the example theory. I guess I gave that, uh, you know, anyway, there's about, there's about a dozen different theories uh, of the atonement that people have uh, hypothesized. Uh, but it seems that Anselm got closest. But I will say this, at the time of the Reformation, 
The reformers didn't like the marketplace metaphor so much, and they substituted a courtroom metaphor. And so it was no longer called the commercial theory, it came to be called the satisfaction theory. And the entire concept was set forth in terms of justice rather than in terms of debt. Same principle, but it became a matter of repaying or correcting the standards of justice, as it were, in the universe rather than paying a debt back, if that makes sense. So the reformers liked it and generally adopted it. And I expect that to the degree you've been exposed to, you know, in Christian doctrine or elsewhere, uh, a theory of the atonement or, or in your church or whatever, it's been something like this. That when we say Jesus died for our sins, what we're saying is that he paid the debt that I owed or he absorbed the wrath that I deserved or some such thing. There's a substitutionary aspect to it that explains what's going on. Comments about that? Does that make sense? I, We'll make sure you got that in your notes. Yes, Jordan. Well, then, since Christ paid, Christ paid for our debt to God, shouldn't, I mean, following this logically, shouldn't we then owe Christ for paying? Yes. Our yeah, you owe him your life. <coughs> You've been bought. You're a slave. You have zero claim to yourself. You are, when you accepted Christ, when you said, you are my Lord, and I will take this great gift of grace that you're offering me. At that point, you relinquished any claim whatsoever to yourself. And you have given yourself as a living sacrifice. No claim. You are simply his property. And that's the appropriate Christian outlook. Anything less than that is idolatry. Got it? So when the Christian says Jesus is Lord, you know, that's what we're saying. He's the Lord, I'm the slave. Paul writes repeatedly, Paulos doulos Christu Jesu. Paul, a slave of Christ. You know, not friend, not buddy, not, you know, companion. Slave. I mean, he puts himself right where he belongs in a biblical outlook. So, that's the answer, I believe, to that question. Anything else on uh, Anselm's view? All right, well, with that, I want to jump then, or leap, as we used to say, like a gazelle. Did I ever do that in your Greek class? Yeah, yeah. Well, don't mention it, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Keep it to yourself. It was actually to uh, sort of, uh, remind me day by day when I taught Greek to two different years, the beginners and the advanced, you know. And at the, be at the end, or about middle way through the class, after I was done with the beginners and gave them some homework, then I would per proverbially, which I can sometimes say, leap like a gazelle to the advanced students. But I'm not going to do it for you because you're not taking credit. And that's only for special people. I might give a private showing to Sydney. She did take Greek, so she deserves it, but I don't think she wants to see it. So, <laughs> All right, enough of this. We're going to move at this point to uh, a somewhat more important character that uh, also shows up about this time in history, whose name is Thomas Aquinas. So. <coughs> Just for fun, Avery, what do you know about Thomas Aquinas? Just name anything that pops to mind that you have besides maybe how to spell his name or anything in your mind, anything you know about Thomas Aquinas, please. Well, I always get him confused with Francis of Assisi. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. Not the same guy. No. They live about the same time. That's probably why. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, okay. What I know, he was a great church thinker. Okay, certainly that. Very good. 
Yep. You leave it at that? Pass the, Pass the baton, baton to Alicia? Okay. Yep. Yes? I think he lived in the 12th century? He lived in the 13th century, which is the 1200s. All right? He's confused. He lived in the 1200s. I'll give you his dates. Well, let's give you, I'll give you his dates right now. Amazing. Dates. 1225 to 1274. 1225 to 1274, which is to say he died when he was a little over 10 years younger than I am. Really. But, yeah, funny. Yeah. So, fairly young guy, because I'm a fairly young guy. And no, 10 years younger than you is a fairly young guy. You're. <laughs> <laughs> You know, <laughs> if I needed to be insulted, I could just go home. You know that I don't. I don't have to come here for that. <laughs> oh, don't tell Mrs. Gore I said that. I'm in enough trouble most of the time as it is without help from you guys. So, Thomas uh, was born into a time of uh, great skepticism in the history of the church and the reason and you know we sometimes we paint with such a simple brush when we look at these times of history we think everybody was kind of marching around thinking the same way doing the same stuff and we don't realize it was just as complicated then as it is now and this was a time when uh, in some ways the great Christian church which had stood for as it were like the mother of civilization and people had trusted the church and believed everything that it said because in a sense the church had been the savior of mankind now for hundreds of years all through the so-called dark ages it was the church and now by this time people are beginning to be not so sure you know the rising threat of Islam especially has raised questions and it's not just a military threat it's an it's a threat of ideas it's a challenge to the way the church thinks and people were beginning to wonder. You know, now some people were just trying to survive. They were just worrying about their next meal. But a lot of people, at least who had the leisure to do so, were beginning to wonder. Uh, is the church as dependable, as reliable as we had thought? And so he's born into a time, I'm simply going to call it a time of great skepticism. That's somewhat simplistic, but I think it's accurate. And there were two principles in particular that were floating around that were contributing to this skepticism. One is called equipollence, and the other is called double truths. Are those new to you? What were those again? These are, in a sense, the details under skepticism. I'm naming them kind of like three, se three separate things, but really equipolins and double truths were contributing to a broader atmosphere generally of skepticism. Right. Now my question is, do you know the term, anyone ever heard the term equipolins? Is that new to you? Brand new? Okay, how about double truths? All right. If you ever study Thomas Aquinas, you will hear these terms. So I want you to say to yourself, oh, thank you, Mr. Gore. I'm glad I heard it from you first. You know, I just want you to do that, I'm giving you a little heads up. These do, these are standard terms. You will hear them. So let's talk about them here. How to get them before you. I might mention, by the way, that both, you don't hear the terms in our present culture, but both the ideas are very much alive and well today. They are very much in our culture today. Equal Poland's would go something like this. For every ultimate affirmation, for every ultimate affirmation, I'll explain why, what I mean by that in a minute, you can make equally persuasive arguments in the affirmative or in the negative, period. For every ultimate affirmation, you can make equally persuasive arguments in the affirmative or in the negative.
what would be an example of an ultimate affirmation. Matthew, what do you suppose if I asked you just to, an, an ultimate, uh, an, an, a, an affirmation of an ultimate truth, just off the top of your head, an example might be God exists. God exists. That's the one that would first come to mind, and that would qualify. Or there is absolute truth, or there is beauty, you know, or whatever, something that refers to a transcendent idea. And equipolans stood for the notion that one, you can get equally competent debaters to debate the point of God ex God's existence, for example. You get one person on one side and one on the other, and each can make the argument with equal power, leaving you in a state of skepticism. Jesus is the Son of God. Muhammad is a prophet of God. All right. You say, well, now you've got a conflict there. And equal Poland's is the idea that actually in the bottom of, of things you can make either argument with equal force. So it leaves people not knowing. You know, kind of a big question mark floating over their heads. Um, and that's uh, the idea. So equal Poland's was sort of a way of escaping reaching conclusions. And you will find when you, you know, mosey off to uh, university environments, some more than others, that that is a common outlook. That's part of a postmodern outlook, actually. Nobody knows for sure it's whatever's true for you. you know, so if it floats your boat, makes you happy, fulfills your kind of sense of satisfaction and meaning, good. It's your truth. Somebody else has a different view, that's fine for them. Equipolence. It's not called that, but that's a working notion in your culture. The other one is double truths. This one is also one you'll run into. And this is the notion that something can be true. I'm going to put it as a practical concept, and then we'll talk more about it later. Something may be true theologically, but false scientifically. And you can affirm both. This is not the example that, Aqu that uh, Aquinas would have been familiar with, but it's one you may run into. Let me give it to you one more time. Something can be true theologically, while at the same time being false, scientifically. To put it in the categories that Aquinas was using, it can be true at the level of grace, but false at the level of nature. That was the classic medieval distinction between the transcendent order and the kind of this worldly order. I, I met someone who said it this way. This would be a great example. This is, this is not that I was alive at the time of Thomas Aquinas, you know. I met someone within my lifetime who said it this way. Well, you know, religiously and theologically, I don't believe in the theory of evolution. But scientifically, I do. I go, uh, how do you do that exactly? Well, it's just... You know, from, a, from, a, from the point of view of religious truth, biblical truth, I affirm, this is what this person said, I affirm that God created the world in six days. I think the Bible got it right. But, scientifically, I'm an evolutionist. I believe in natural selection, random mutation. How do you do that? Well, people do it every day of the week. This is another part of your culture. You will meet people who will talk to you that way. And if you say to them, do you realize, do you realize that you're being kind of inconsistent here? That you're holding mutually exclusive points of view? They'll say, oh, there you are, just trying to impose your rationalism on me. Don't you know? The life is, life is bigger than that. You don't have to be so bloody logical about everything. You know, and that's what you'll get. How do you reason with that? I don't know. But that's out there. I mean, you know, you'll friend the people, sometimes with lots of letters after their name, that will talk just that way. That's called 
double truth. So what I want you to know is that while Thomas Aquinas is dealing in his day with ideas that went by those names, the names are gone. The, the concepts are still out there in the world in which you live. You know. um, Sidney, was that you? So the guy who was telling you that he believed theologically in right. God's creation, did he also say that he firmly believed in evolution or that he understood the... No, no, no. He meant he believed it. He, he was affirming it. Yeah, double truths. It's true at one point and not at the other. Um, if, I can, if I can run way ahead, I'm just going to drop a seed. I don't want to get off on this as a detour at this point, but this is the effect of Immanuel Kant. This is what Kant has done to the modern world. He's distinguished noumenal truth from phenomenal truth and put a wall between the two levels called Kant's wall. And that's why you get people walking around these days saying absurd things like that, in my humble opinion. You know. Now this is not what Aquinas was dealing with. Aquinas lived before Kant, so he didn't know anything about Kant. But I'm just saying Kant has created in the modern world something of what this conflict had produced at the time of Thomas Aquinas that had some of the same effects, some of the same kinds of uh, you know, ways of thinking uh, were produced there. All right, so uh, I don't want to talk about those yet. I just want you to get those terms in your notes. We'll come back and look at them. Uh, this, I'm just giving you preliminary stuff here about Thomas Aquinas. Uh, he worked uh, as, a, as a scholar for only about years, fairly short career. And in that years, he produced 30 large volumes I'm quite pleased that in my lifetime I've produced one large volume, you know? And my one large volume isn't even worth comparing to the least of Thomas Aquinas' work. He was a genius of unbelievable uh, proportions. He's more important to the Catholic Church than to the Protestants. Typically, you'll find Protestants are suspicious of Thomas Aquinas. I don't think he's getting a fair shake. So let me just say, I have not come here to bury Thomas Aquinas. I want you to love this man. Even though he's a Catholic, and even though I don't buy everything he said, especially on the sacraments, in the greater scheme of things, he made huge and wonderful, helpful contributions uh, to the development of Christian understanding, for which I think we should all be grateful even though he has been used, certainly by the Catholics, uh, at times as something of a weapon. He was responding to the threat posed by an Aristotelian outlook, especially that was being mounted by the Islamic forces in the world. So Thomas Aquinas is going to use Aristotle to respond to those who are skeptical about the Christian claim. That causes some people to claim that Thomas is just an Aristotelian. You know. That's not fair. He's using the language of his day just as Augustine used the language of his day, which <coughs> tended to be more Neoplatonic, you know, to make his case. He's using the terms, the tools that were available to him. All right. So as I said, he was born in 1225. Died in 1274. Died at 49 years of age. He was born in a little town in Sicily called Aquina. Hence, Thomas Aquinas. He was the seventh son of a seventh son. No, just kidding. He was uh, the seventh son, however, of a guy by the name of Count he was an aristocrat. He was born of Lomb Lombard extraction, nobility. Born in a castle, born wealthy. So he had a pretty good birth, you know. It was recognized quite early that he was a genius, brilliant. I mean, you know, one of these kids that by the time he's two years old, he's you know, reciting by heart vast tracts of confessional statements and so on. So anyway, in his early teens, he was sent off to become a Benedictine monk. Benedictine. And in preparation for that, was sent to Naples. Where is Naples? 
Where is Naples on a map? It's not on that map. Well, I guess it is on that map, kind of. Where is Naples vis-a-vis -vis anything in the world? Spencer? It's in Italy. It is in Italy. Um, what part of Italy? I think it's uh, in the, the top next to the mountains. You got us in the right country, but the wrong geography. Where is it? Where is Naples with respect to Italy? This is my tiny little Italy here. You can hardly see it. It's not the name, but it's down here at the bottom. Oops, that's Greece. Italy over here. Uh, <laughs> so here's uh, Naples would be at the bottom. Sicily, of course, is the island off the boot of, um, of Italy. And so he didn't go too far from home. You know, to go to school at uh, Naples didn't mean that he was... Uh, he was that far from home. But there in Naples, he was exposed to a new order of monks. His family wanted him to be Benedictine for political reasons. They were kind of in, in the Catholic Church and so on. But he was exposed to a new order of monks and very much taken by them at 14 years of age. And this new order of monks was known as the, anybody know? The Benedictines were the old line. St. Benedict went all the way back to the five, 580 or so. But the new order was Ben? Um, Dominican. Dominican. Dominican Zion? I'm not sure that's right either. Dominican. How do I have it here? It's I. Okay, I think that's right. Dominican. The Dominicans were a fairly new order. They had been formed precisely to answer the Islamic threat. They were an academic order of monks. That was their main concern. And that was what Aquinas wanted to do. And so when he found out that there were these Dominicans in the world, he wanted to be one. And his family was very, very upset. And they did not want him to be a Dominican, this kind of Johnny come lately, new kid on the block, you know, sort of, uh, yes, what do you want? Uh, me and Spencer. Oh, that's, you got, you have to leave. Who else has to leave? All right. You who are staying, I will now tell you exactly what's going to be on the next test. You're sworn to secrecy. Pick in your shirt, Spence. didn't reach him. Uh, all right, have fun, all of you. You too? You're leaving too? Oh, dear. Oh, you, you me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. Well, that's okay. You can... <laughs> yeah. All right, so uh, anyway, uh, this created quite a uh, conflict in the family, quite a uh, crisis. And it led to one of the most interesting little stories in uh, church history that's told faithfully by the guy that was the, the friend of and biographer of uh, Thomas Aquinas. And so this is taken as, uh, as virtually certainly true, this story. Thomas um, had a conflict with his parents that re resulted in a split. And he said, I'm going to be a Dominican and act a contrary to your parental authority. By this time his mother or his father was dead, but his mother was the matriarch and didn't want him to do that. So he went off and joined the Dominicans. Um, and um, his mother was so upset that she ordered the older brothers of Thomas to go and kidnap him and bring him home to the family castle where they were going to keep him imprisoned until he changed his mind. So the mother sends these uh, older brothers of Thomas and they catch him, you know, like in the bushes. He's, he's, uh, they jump out and grab him and they tie him up and throw him on the back of a cart and they start taking him back home. And on the way home, they uh, stop in at an inn for the night. This is a famous story. Anybody ever heard this story? Hey, there's a body in the back of that car. Yeah. Well, <laughs> they stop in. I think they untied him. I don't think, I don't think Thomas was trying to fight or anything. So anyway, he, he uh, submitted to this. And they got to this inn. 
And they all checked in and they put uh, Thomas in one room and they went into their own rooms. And uh, then these older brothers got this idea, you know, we could put an end to this whole silly business of Thomas being a monk at all if we could just get him to commit mortal sin. This was their plan. And so they went out into the streets that evening and found what's sometimes called felicitously a lady of the night. <laughs> now, personally, I don't know what that is, but you know, some of you guys may have some clue about that. Uh, and anyway, they went out and they hired this uh, young lady and brought her in with the instructions to go into Thomas's room and seduce him. And by so doing, of course, he'd be so seized with guilt and this, this very horrible commit, sin that he would have committed and he'd never think of going ahead and pursuing his monkish ambition. So that was their plan. And uh, so anyway, I'm going to read to you now uh, the account from Reginald uh, as he told this story concerning this incident. So this is a quote. Uh, a pretty young girl with all the charms of the temptress was introduced into the room where he was sleeping. He awakened. He leaped up. He grabbed hold of a flaming firebrand and chased her out and then proceeded to trace the sign of the cross on the door with the firebrand. And from that time on, by angelic grace, he was never to experience any impulse of the flesh. That is one of the most famous little stories in church history. And so if you ever hear an allusion to Aquinas and the firebrand and all of that, uh, uh, that's what it's about. So anyway, um, simply to say that particular tactic was unsuccessful. But they did bring Thomas back to the family castle. They locked him into a room, made him a prisoner in his own home, hoping that they would break his will, you know, and cause him to see the light. But all the time that he was there, uh, he went through all of the disciplines of a Dominican monk, which were quite a few, prayers in the morning and all of this fasting and stuff that he would do. All of it in perfect conformity to the rule of the Dominican order of monks even though he was out of touch with all of them. He was doing this all in isolation. Eventually, his sister uh, became convinced that, you know, this was the wrong thing to do. And even the mother eventually came to realize that they needed to let Thomas uh, go in the direction that he wished to go. But the mother was worried about saving face, and so she had to figure out a way now to help Thomas escape from the palace. This is a wonderful story. If you ever a chance to read the uh, biography of, of Thomas from Reginald, it's really worth reading. So anyway, she kind of like the Apostle Paul, she sort of helps Thomas out this upper window in a basket from their palace. And he comes dangling down, you know, and runs off into the night and returns to his uh, Dominican order. So anyway. Well, uh, he went to Paris from there. This is about the year of 1245 now. Um, so he's about 20, what, 20 years old. Uh, went to Paris, studied for three years. From there he went to Cologne to work under one of the greatest theologians of the world at that time, a guy by the name of Albertus Magnus. Albertus Magnus. Albertus Magnus is probably a guy we would all be familiar with were it not for Thomas Aquinas. It's one of those cases where the student so greatly exceeded the master that the master is lost and all we know of is the student. That's what I expect to happen, you know. Gore would have been famous someday, but there's going to be Trevor De And he's going to go out there and he's going to so vastly exceed Gore in his insight and that Gore will just be lost. A blip in history and we'll all be thinking about Deweyism years from now because you will become this great... Uh, I'll give you some credit. Though. Yeah, thank you. Well, do give me some credit. I appreciate it. So anyway, uh, Thomas winds up in the school of Albertus Magnus. Uh, this school was not quite like the... These people were pretty, um, 
they, they didn't have wonderful Christian uh, affection for each other. You know, they were pretty brutal with each other. And when Thomas first showed up, they all universally thought this guy was just an oaf. He was just kind of a, you know, he, in fact, he picked up a nickname which is stuck down through history. You'll hear this as the nickname of Thomas Aquinas, that he is the what? Does anybody know the nickname of Thomas Aquinas? Ever heard it? You know, Jake? He's called the dumb ox. <laughs> you ever heard of that? He's called the dumb ox of Sicily. <laughs> Fortunately, I don't think we use terms like that around the ocean. I don't know. I was kind of trying to. You know. This is Cologne. He was in Paris for a while, then he went to Cologne. So anyway, they would tease him. The reason they called him this was because Thomas Aquinas was reputedly a kind of a large guy. He was prematurely bald. He was fairly portly, and he kind of walked around with an expression on his face that didn't look like he was thinking very deep things. He just sort of looked like you know, kind of walking around. <laughs> and uh, so they looked at him, and that's what they called him. And they thought, you know, what did, how did this guy get into this school? They were all very proud. They were like at the you know, ancient equivalent of Harvard or something like that. They thought they were at the center of the academic universe. And all of a sudden, you got this, this uh, Thomas Aquinas guy who just looks like he doesn't fit at all. And so they just start calling him that. And they called him that, and he was well aware of it. But he didn't try to respond. They thought he was kind of dull-witted, stupid. And, uh... But anyway, all of that changed on one occasion when all of the students were required to prepare a paper and present it, very much as you do here from time to time. You prepare presentations and make them before your classmates and uh, you know, submit yourself to their critique and feedback and questions and so on. That's been a standard educational model for years and that's what Thomas Aquinas had to do. So he wrote a paper, as did all the students, in the scholastic style on a particular point. I don't know what the point was, but uh, they all had to write on this subject. And then uh, they would all be required to stand up. So one after another, each student stands up, presents his paper, the students critique, you know, and so on. And then Thomas uh, is required to get up like everyone else did and read his paper. And so he begins reading this paper. And all of his classmates sit there in stunned silence as they realize that the depth of the insight, the breadth of understanding that he has of the classics, the free and easy use he makes of all of that rich tradition plus his own insight is just so far ahead of theirs that you can't even see here from there. You know, it's like it's just, and they just sit there just shocked. At the end of his presentation, Thomas waits to be critiqued by the students. Nobody says anything. Nobody's even in the league to critique him, you know. And so after waiting a polite amount of time, Thomas picks up his paper and lumbers back to his seat like the dumb ox, you know, except for now they know they have misjudged the uh, dumb ox. And so after a little bit of silence, uh, Albertus Magnus, who of course is running the classroom, sits there with a little bemused smile on his face and he says uh, reportedly this is what he said quote well gentlemen it seems as though this dumb ox of Sicily will one day through the power of his mind turn the world upside down you know and from that point on these guys treated him with a little bit more respect so uh, anyway he finished his uh, his uh, instruction there and uh, became then after that just basically a professor he was a monk a scholar uh, his personal appearance, as I was indicating, he was a person of lofty stature. He was large, he was big, he was dark, and he was quite portly. So he did like to eat, I think we can say that. But he was said to stand erect, tanned, and had an unusually large head. I'm just giving the description to you. Upon this head there was little or no hair. You know. Some of you guys will be feeling the pinch soon enough, but you're not quite there yet. He was, Thomas Aquinas was, absent-minded in the extreme. He was the original 
absent-minded professor. His mind was always so engaged in you know, his theological ponderings that he was often kind of lost in terms of his immediate situation, very much as I am, which I attribute to genius. You know, I frequently am completely confused as to what's going on in my environment. And uh, so I figure Thomas and me, we kind of you know, share that in common. <laughs> um, there's one uh, kind of funny story when he was uh, sitting at the table of the French king, a king by the name of King Louis, they were all named Louis, you know, Louis the 14th, or the, well this was like Louis the 9th or something, and he was there uh, having dinner, this is quite, a pres quite, quite an honor, you know, the, to be eating with the king and some other monks, this was later in his career when he'd become a famous guy, and he's sitting there and King Louis is trying to engage him in polite conversation around the dinner and and it uh, becomes obvious that uh, Thomas's mind is just somewhere else. And, you know, the, the brothers who are there, the monks are trying to kick him under the table. Thomas, for Pete's sake, it's the king talking to you. Would you please pay attention, you know, kind of deal. And, and uh, all of a sudden, in the midst of this kind of, he's just sort of in outer space, you know. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, he slams his hand down on the table. Just the big old hand, you know. Wham! He goes like this, and all the goblets, you know, are flying. And he, he says, I've got it! The convincing response to the Manichaean heresy, he goes. The brothers are going, the Manichaean heresy? <laughs> Thomas! But, as Reginald tells the story, the king realized, ah, this is the genius of this monk, and he immediately summoned for a secretary to come in so that Thomas, right at the dinner table, could dictate this uh, little gem of genius that had just come to him. So, you know, he was an interesting guy. He was, uh, he was really quite a, uh, quite a personality. He was, um, he was a man of great genius and great humility. And there's many stories. I'm just going to tell you, well, I didn't have time to tell you one. Um, I'll tell you one short one. We'll have to finish this. Uh, uh, there was one occasion, Reginald again tells the story, that Thomas was sitting in his cubicle, you know, working away with all his books and stuff. And uh, one of the monks was going to play a joke on him. So went over to the window, looks out, and says, Thomas, quick! There's a flying ox! And Thomas reportedly gets up from his studies, interrupts his, you know, walks over, lumbers over, which is a considerable effort, and looks out the window, <laughs> and uh, there's no flying ox. And all the other monks just break out in laughter. Thomas, why well, can you be such an idiot that you would believe there'd be a flying ox out the window? To which Thomas reportedly responded, Quote, it is better to think that an ox could fly than that a monk could lie. Ooh. <laughs> so, anyway, we will leave it at there for the time being.